Well, 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 look who it is. So you want to know how the British class system works, eh? Perhaps you're thinking of visiting here, or maybe even moving here. If so, get lost, we're full. But regardless of your reasoning, it's always a pleasure to see people take an interest in our joyous land. And by joyous, I mean increasingly not joyous in the slightest. The first thing you have to understand about the UK is that it's one of the only Western countries in the world who has not, in recent times, undergone a revolution of either a republican, communistic, or fascistic nature. Unlike the French, our monarchy is still intact. Unlike the Russians, our economy is still intact. And unlike the Germans, our dignity is still intact. This might just sound like fluff, but what this really means is that the social order of the UK has remained borderline unchanged for centuries. In more modernised countries, like, say, the United States, it's actually quite common to see people who are poor skyrocketing into wealth. In fact, the top 10% of America is constantly ever-shifting. This is because the United States has an incredibly flexible level of social mobility. The fact that at the time of recording, the richest man in America, Elon Musk, is an immigrant from South Africa, or the second richest man, Jeff Bezos, started his career at McDonald's, showcases such social mobility very well. Of course, elitism and nepotism still exist, and poor Americans are notoriously treated like garbage, but there's a reason why America is known as the land of opportunity, as there really is no place where it's easier to do well for yourself. Which is the reason why millions of people from around the world, especially entrepreneurs, want to move to America so badly. Continental Europe is different in the sense that it doesn't prioritise social mobility, but more quality of life, with the main aim of such countries, as shown especially well in the Nordic nations, being to ensure everyone has enough to get by, regardless of one's personal wealth. Achieved via heavy investments in things like public education, healthcare and transport. Logic that was inspired via communist rhetoric. But regardless of whether it's America or continental Europe, the fundamental logic is nevertheless the same. In terms of wealth, these societies are generally one big cultural bubble. You could take some of the richest men in America or continental Europe and pair them up with a bunch of poor people off the street, and despite their day-to-day -day lives being completely different, they will probably still be able to have a conversation with one another and relate in at least some regard. But in the UK, a wealthy Brit and a poor Brit, if paired together, would not only likely have nothing in common with each other, but probably wouldn't even be able to understand each other. But why? Well, because unlike in America, the UK has almost no social mobility whatsoever. And unlike in continental Europe, there has been absolutely no attempt to modernise, equalise, or any other word that ends in eyes, British society. Hence why the British class system exists. But what is class, anyway? Many people think that class, in the British sense, is simply how much money you have. But that's only really half the story. For class is also your connections what kind of family you were born into, and thus the circle that you found yourself moulded in. Take Ricky Gervais, for example. He came from a poor family, however, later on in life, did very well for himself because of his comedy. Materially, then, he is now rich. However, he also still has the cultural mindset of someone from a poor class. Hence why he's willing to mercilessly shred and rip into famous Hollywood actors, despite being one of them himself. That's right, you're in no position to lecture the public about anything. You know nothing about the real world. Most of you spent less time in school than Greta Thunberg. So, if you win, right, come up, accept your little award, thank your agent and your god, and f off, okay? Ricky Gervais has the money that deems him wealthy, but doesn't really fit in within such wealthy circles, whereby he is considered to be a menacing outlier. Meanwhile, almost everyone else sees him as being some sort of voice of the common man. Shut up. 
Shut up. I don't care. I don't care. A great example of the opposite scenario has to be Jacob Rees-Mogg. The son of a lord, Jacob had a highly privileged upbringing, being partially raised by a family nanny. He went to one of the most prestigious private schools in the country, the world-renowned Eton College, which has a tuition fee per term of thousands of pounds. He had a luxury Count's bank account, available to only the wealthiest of patrons, opened for him at the mere age of 13, and went on in adulthood to work in the financial industry, amassing a wealth estimated to be in the millions of pounds. Despite all this, however, Jacob would eventually desire to become a member of parliament for the Conservative Party, of which he did successfully. However, as the job of a member of parliament is of course to try and relate to the general public, his attempts to do so are often seen as unintentionally comedic, because of how little he actually fits in. All these MPs now, they're just living off the taxpayers' money, man, they're getting... And we need to cut taxes, you're absolutely right. In essence, it doesn't really matter how much Jacob tries to relate to the general public, as due to the isolated circles he grew up in, it is simply impossible for him to ever do so. And before I go, I've got one final question for you. Is there a Conservative other than me in this room? No? Yes? Oh, we've got one or two. Thank you. Thank you very much. That and the fact it's pretty obvious that even if he, as an individual, messed up materially, because of his prestigious connections, he would nevertheless likely still be fine. Which only makes him more unlikable with the common man, for whom financial failure actually stings. <laughs> Essentially, class, though often correlated by the number in one's bank account, is deeper than that. It's the bubble that someone has been brought up in that determines their mannerisms, attitude, optimism, religiosity, and, well, almost everything in life. An interesting phenomenon I've noticed is the way that Americans and continental Europeans perceive the British people in an almost polar opposite way. Americans often see the British as a wise, well-mannered, and well-dressed people, who are joyous company to be around. Continental Europeans, however, often see the British as foolish, loud, drunken brutes, who are burly civilised. But how is it that the same people can be perceived in such a contrasting way? Simple. There is no such thing as a unified British identity. There is only the classes, of which the Americans, being much more further away, are often only exposed to the higher, whereas the Europeans, being right next door, are much more exposed to the lower. Hence why I say that the UK, as a country, is not home to one people, but numerous distinct types of people that merely roleplay under the same banner as if they are one, but they are not one. They self-segregate from one another. They have different cultural customs, different economic standards, different diets. Some accents are considered so unique that they may as well be different languages. What the rest of the Western world doesn't realise about the UK is that talks of its class system isn't just some nonsensical socialist babblespeak, but a genuine sociological phenomenon. So strong, in fact, that it's even somewhat comparable to the Indian caste system in its scope. The only two groups of people who really understand firsthand how bizarre it all is are either British people who have lived overseas for a long time, or foreigners who come to the UK and live here for a while. It is, truly, a bizarre social system to see in the 21st century. But enough shucking and jiving. What are these supposed classes anyway? Well, it's not like people walk around wearing different coloured armbands that symbolise their class. Class is, after all, a sociological structure, not an official doctrine of sorts. So, ultimately, it depends on who you ask. But in my interpretation, there's five of them. And we're going to start off completely out of order by taking a look at the working class. The best way to describe the British working class is people who come from backgrounds of work, but doing the jobs that typically don't warrant respect. Bus drivers, bin men, plumbers. Such professions are the backbone of not just British society, but any society, and yet are often taken for granted by all. Well, until a strike happens and then suddenly everyone is on their knees, but I digress. Of course, there's no shame in having a low-paying or not very well-respected job, 
but there is shame in taking pride in not being well paid or not being well respected. And that is the British working class in a nutshell. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you took a group of people and genetically engineered them over the course of hundreds of years to have absolutely zero meaningful aspirations of any kind? Well, wonder no more. Because the British working class have been historically discouraged from pursuing silly things like making money, gathering knowledge, getting involved in politics, or, you know, literally anything, they tend to have absolutely no confidence in any talents they may have, and thus never capitalise on them. In fact, anyone in the working class who actually wants to do more than eat Walker's crisps, watch Anton Deck's Saturday Night Takeaway, and work a minimum wage job, are often mocked beyond belief. Oh, you can't be serious, can you? Come on, lad, just sit down and have a pint. Calm down a bit, bloody hell. This is because they have what's known as a crabs in a bucket mentality, whereby because working class culture puts mediocrity on a pedestal, they hate to see people actually succeed in any meaningful way, which means that you too must be dragged down to their level at every opportunity. And as a result, anyone from the working class who by a miracle from God actually does manage to make something of themselves, almost always tends to move overseas and never come back. Probably because they get used to the luxury of being treated like an actual human being, and not surrounded by people who just want to bring them down. Well, except John Lennon. Turns out someone did want to bring him down. But I digress. Despite this self-defeating mindset being a well-known phenomenon, almost nothing is ever done to tackle it that isn't symbolic in nature. Primarily because the British Labour Party, whose sole reason to exist is to correct this, has been too busy spending the last few decades waving rainbow flags around and being utterly useless. Thanks, Tony Blair. Um, uh, Believe it or not, the working class historically used to be called the lower class, but eventually people said, Hmm, that's not very nice. Should we introduce some sort of social equalisation? No, let's just call them working class instead. Genius! Which is the British equivalent of changing the expiry date on milk and pretending like you've just solved the problem. Fortunately, when it comes to housing, working class people actually tend to own their own houses. But wait, there's a catch. Because these houses aren't just normal houses, but terraced houses. Do you see this odd rectangle here that looks like a cake slice? This is actually someone's house. I'm not joking. You see, in any normal country, houses have four walls and live next to each other, like so. But in the UK, the builders instead said, Hey, what if they just, like, shared a wall? And that's exactly what terraced houses are. This means that if your bedroom shared a wall with, say, your neighbour's bathroom, and that neighbour had seismic diarrhoea that was banging against his hemorrhoids, you would be able to hear everything as if you were in the same room as him. Sorry chaps, but in the UK, having one millimetre of space with a separate wall is just way too much of a luxury, I'm afraid. Essentially meaning that practically every working class home has almost no privacy, because your neighbours can hear even the mildest of whispers through your paper-thin walls. This is classed as a first world country, I might add. A first world country. Oh well, look on the bright side. At least we don't all have to live in Birmingham. Just woke up in a fucking steaming mood, yeah? Because I live in a shit hole. Do you know what I mean? Birmingham is a fucking shit hole. I hate the fucking place. I fucking hate it. It's full of dickheads. I fucking hate it. The average working class weekly schedule tends to revolve around work, 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 work whereby on Saturday, they spend all their money getting absolutely hammered with alcohol to temporarily forget how miserable their existence is, only to spend all Sunday trying to recover from an almighty hangover. What a life. 
When they aren't drunk, however, because working class people live such terrible lives, they tend to be obsessed with the bread and circus, such as living vicariously through celebrities. With the men being obsessed with footballers, Bloody hell, mate. I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever seen worse players than this. They're an absolute travesty. If I was manager, I'd just say, Luke, just score some bloody goals, you know. Hey up, hey up. Oh my god, oh my god. Oh my god. No, I can't believe that one. That's absolutely a bloody incredible. Good player, I mean, him bloody oh, bloody I'd buy him a Greg's. I'd buy him a Greg's. I tell you what. Or with the women being obsessed with royalty. Who does that Camilla think she is? She's not bloody queen. Absolutely not. There's only one queen round here, and that's Princess Diana, isn't it? Oh aye. Absolutely. Oh aye. Absolutely. Oh aye. It has been scientifically observed that every working class person starts off life looking like a famished orphan, but by the age of 40, is guaranteed to resemble some kind of human bulldog. No one is quite sure how this transformation happens, or why, all we know is that it does. Actually, one reason why might be their atrocious diets, as working class towns are littered with crime scenes known as chippies. A chippy is essentially the British equivalent of a fast food chain, except the food isn't fast and there's no chain. Resembling something akin to what an early AI would generate, this artery-killing food is likely made up of 90% grease and 10% rat feces. Nevertheless, the working classes love it so much that they even eat it out of newspaper. Ink poisoning and one-star hygiene ratings be damned. I've conquered all the chippies, I'm never gonna stop. Chips and peas and gravy, I've had the f***ing lot. Pepperoni pizza and chicken vindaloo. I'm a big fat bastard, cause I love my f***ing food. Ale, 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 ale. In summary, the British working class are the UK's genetically manufactured workers, who aspire to nothing, live in shacks, and subsist on grease that's been marketed as food. They are utterly hopeless, and anyone with a brain born into it just ends up leaving the country, cursed for life with PTSD flashbacks about how crap it was. Simple as. So at this point you're probably thinking, wow, that was depressing. <laughs> it couldn't possibly get any worse than that. Right? WRONG! As you see, the working class used to be the lowest of them all, but thanks to new innovations in suffering, we have actually managed to create something even worse. Introducing... The Underclass. The best way to describe the British underclass are people who are generationally reliant on the state. Basically, taking the working class, but removing the whole working part. If you've watched my production on decadence, you'll already know all about these chaps already. Starting in the 1980s, the world started to undergo an event known as globalization where manufacturing or resource-gathering jobs would be relocated from Western nations to developing nations in order to save money, which resulted in large swaths of people becoming unemployed and affected practically every Western nation very badly. However, fortunately many of such nations came up with a genius plan to deal with such fallout. Step 1. Give such redundant people welfare. Step 2. Ensure such people stay socially cohesive with the rest of society. And step 3. Retrain such people to more relevant jobs, so that step 1 and 2 are no longer necessary. And this plan worked out pretty well. The UK, on the other hand, had a different plan, which was... Step 1. Give such redundant people welfare... No, that's it. That was the plan. 
The UK suffered much more than most other Western nations, primarily because under the incredibly genius rule of Margaret Thatcher, who was a fanatical supporter of globalization, the process became so rushed that what to do with the people affected by it wasn't taken into serious consideration at the time. This meant that the more industrial parts of the nation, such as the north of England, Wales and Scotland, started to fall behind compared to the much more prosperous south. Something that she was warned about numerous times as Prime Minister, but simply refused to accept. Mrs Thatcher, as a first time voter, I would like to know what you intend to do about the growing division between the North and the South. Well, I don't, I think if I might say so, that that tends to be exaggerated. No. No. Well, at the moment, I think it tends to be exaggerated. Which meant that fast forward 40 years later, nine out of the ten poorest places in Northern Europe are in the UK alone. Nine out of ten. While the richest place is, of course, in London. What a coincidence. Tends to be exaggerated. In fact, Margaret Thatcher did so much damage to the fabric of the British working class that when she died in 2013, people actually held parties just to celebrate her death. I'm not making this up. A ghoulish caricature of the Iron Lady loomed over the crowd, a gathering in defiance of critics who described the idea of such a party as disgraceful. One of the biggest cheers was given to a contingent from the coal fields of Britain's northeast. We're here in order to demonstrate that a very, very large percentage of the people, particularly the working class who she hated, uh, don't agree with anything she did. We don't think she made Britain great. She destroyed everything that we made and handed us over to the bankers and the speculators. But why were people so angry? And what kind of damage actually occurred because of her policies? Well, because people who worked in coal mines for the last 500 years shockingly did not become computer programmers overnight, their skills essentially became worthless, leading to a massive reliance on the state and no plan to stop it. As a result, alcoholism went up, drug use went up, single motherhood went up, crime went up, literally everything terrible you could imagine went up, overall morphing an ever-increasing section of the working class into a new, somehow worse form. The underclass, whose sole purpose in life is to... well, that's the point. They have no purpose. Men in the underclass are often seen wearing a black tracksuit they bought for £10 in a Primark Christmas sale, an attire so common that it's become almost like a uniform. A vain attempt to look tough and intimidating, when in reality, it just makes them look like a tryhard. The women, on the other hand, tend to go in the exact opposite direction, wearing as little as possible, or, in some cases, absolutely nothing, serving almost as a walking advertisement for converting to Islam. But regardless of gender, everyone in the underclass can easily be identified by the fact that they own a 10-year-old iPhone 6S with a cracked screen for some reason. Fortunately, as the underclass are seemingly forced by law to live in concentration camps known as council estates, it's very unlikely you'll ever come across any. So, phew. Out of sight, out of mind, am I right? You can always tell you're in an underclass area, because they seemingly can't help but leave these unusual markings behind wherever they go, that anthropologists have called graffiti. No one quite knows yet what they are meant to represent or mean, for it looks like they are written in some sort of alien alphabet. Cyrillic, perhaps? Who knows? Jokes aside, it should be noted that every problem that Britain has is almost always blamed on the underclass by practically everyone else. An economic crisis? Well, it can't be those greedy bankers. It must be those damn £20 a week universal credit payments. Those scrangers! No one ever asks, wait, why do we even have an underclass of this calibre in the first place? As that would require the British people to have an ounce of self-reflection. And so instead, our way to deal with them is to simply say, Haha, you're an idiot, also you're poor, lol. The underclass are viewed similar to a dancing circus burr, something we can cruelly watch to make us feel better about how crap our own lives are. 
In fact, the entire premise of the most popular show in British morning television history, The Jeremy Carl Show, was to bait members of the underclass to come on television in order to see them argue with each other and make a tit of themselves, while being berated by the wealthy host in order to make them feel bad. However, after a man committed suicide after coming on the show, after over a decade on the air, the company behind it, ITV, suddenly conveniently concluded, Wait, is this cruel? Oh my god, we, we didn't realise! Oh, we're sorry. Oh, we're so sorry. And the show was subsequently cancelled and scrubbed off the internet faster than you can blink. Can't lie, the show was pretty entertaining though. In summary, the British underclass are an artificially manufactured result of what happens when you handle globalisation poorly decadent dregs taken to a generational level who everyone else in the country uses to feel better about themselves. Simple as! Wow, that was grim. <laughs> but, um, who's responsible for all this? I mean... Uh, uh, oh, do you, do you smell that? Oh, that smells like... Sulfur. Which brings us on nicely to the middle class. The best way to describe the British middle class is those who do jobs that typically kindle respect, such as something that requires an academic qualification. Well, no, actually. The most accurate way to describe the British middle class would be demonic as I guarantee that if you managed to find a few blocks of obsidian and then set them on fire, they'd all scurry on over and go, Ah, home sweet home. You will clap for the NHS. You will clap for the NHS. You will clap for the NHS on Wednesday at 4pm. There's a reason why when you take a British citizenship test, you get bonus points for stating that kindness is not a British value. And it's because of these demons. But what's so bad about them? Well, the main crime of the British middle class is that almost anything that would actually improve the nation, especially for those in the classes below them, is automatically rejected by the vast majority of them. The same group of people who in the previous generation voted for Margaret Thatcher three times in a row have now had their descendants morph into a mindless horde of unpatriotic, pseudo-socialist cosmopolitans. Crime is going up in poor neighbourhoods. Should we hire more police to solve the problem? No. Let's instead mimic American progressives and declare that all cops are bastards, ensuring that only the most well-off areas are actually free from crime. That's the middle class way. Those pesky nationalists are making gains again. Should we listen to their concerns? No. Let's instead create hate speech laws to suppress the free flow of information online, ensuring that only the official narrative is allowed to be repeated. That's the middle class way. Mass migration is transforming Britain's culture on a level never before seen. Should we preach assimilation? No. Let's instead just call anyone who doesn't want to feel like a foreigner in their own country a racist, ensuring that actual racism spawns from ignoring the problem for too long. That's the middle class way. You see, middle class in the UK doesn't actually mean middle or average or typical. As to most people, it just means twat, or bad. You worshippers of Gaia, you sacrificers of the wealth and property of others, you would-be planetary saviors, you Machiavellian- I mean, imagine how stupid you'd have to be to want a government for your government. Well, imagine no more, as that's the European Union, aka the new god of the British middle class. Trade offer. I receive control of your borders, currency, and laws. You receive daily terrorism, being made a minority in your own country, and get to be part of an ever-stagnating, over-regulated economic block. And they actually look at that and go, Sign me up! Stop Brexit! 
You will support open borders. You will support open borders. You will support open borders for no reason other than making the working classes' lives worse. They're the kind of people who believe that having Spotify Premium is a human right. The kind of people who make a Facebook profile for their dog. The kind of people who knit hats for the local post box. Just absolutely insufferable people. Groups like Just Stop Oil, Extinction Rebellion, or literally any annoying beyond comprehension environmental movement is almost guaranteed to be exclusively populated by middle class people. No doubt thanks to their obsession with the mainstream media, which essentially serves as their bible. But by far the worst part of the middle class is this unique obsession they have with trying to roleplay as if they came from a working class upbringing, even though they didn't. Very working, working class. Be day. honest. I, I am being Be honest. honest. I am being what honest. What did your dra dad drive you to school in? So my dad. Did, no, one answer. My dad. What well, car was it? Uh, it's not a simple answer what because. What car? What did you? Get your dad to drive it depends. To no, 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 no. Okay, what in the eighties, my dad had a Rolls Royce. Thank you. They do this role play because deep down they hate themselves and are ashamed of their privileged background, which, to be fair, is completely understandable. As if I spent five years at university only to end up with a fake email job at some international conglomerate that paid me less than an American car wash manager, I'd probably hate myself as well. You will free Palestine. You will free Palestine. You will free Palestine, even though I don't really have anything to do with Palestine. I'm just here to feel like I'm doing something. Sorry. With every class, I have at least something good to say about them. But not these. In fact, the only compliment I can give them is that at least their houses tend to have four actual walls. So that's nice, I suppose. Now, while I'm sure there are some good people in the middle class, all I can say is that in my 20 plus years of living in the UK, I have yet to see one that hasn't been a complete prick. Well, except Peter Hitchens. He's great. You will pay your TV license. You will pay your TV license. You will pay your TV license so we can watch female Doctor Who. <laughs> oh, and for all you foreign history buffs out there who won't stop crying about how your country got owned by Britain, know this. Any atrocity actually committed throughout history by the British Empire was almost guaranteed to have been carried out by these sadistic psychopaths, who now, in this post-imperial era, are taking out their desire to cause pain on those below them by destroying their own nation rather than someone else's. Words truly cannot describe how evil these people are, and may God have mercy on their souls. Amen. P.S. What the hell is a pret a manga anyway? God, you people make me sick. You will browse reddit.com. You will browse reddit.com. <laughs> you will browse reddit. Fuck, get out of here. In summary, the British middle class are Satan's minions, put on this earth with the sole purpose of sadistically making other people's lives worse to try to make themselves feel better about how much they rightfully hate themselves. Simple as. Be gone, demons! Be gone! Oh, phew. Glad that part's over with. Which brings us on to the upper class. The best way to describe the British upper class are people who are so loaded that they don't have to work at all. Mummy, you've only put two million in my trust fund. Surely you don't need any more than two million, dearie. 
two million? I can't even buy all the Fortnite skins I want for that. Oh, I'm so sorry, dearie. Here's another four million for you. I hope that's okay. Oh, well, I guess it'll do. Think millionaires, multimillionaires, or even billionaires. The upper class are the richest class in the country, but they don't usually just laze around sipping martinis all day. They're often found somewhere in the upper echelons of fancy financial institutions, real estate markets, or, you know, rich people places. Whereas the middle class have to brown nose their way to any sort of prominent position, which probably explains why they're so insufferable, the upper class can instead take advantage of connections through well-established networks that their families are a part of. And where are such connections typically acquired? Private education. Whereas the peasants have to go to public schools funded by the taxpayer, the upper class instead create their own schools and barricade entry from the riffraff via extortionate tuition fees that only they can afford as mentioned earlier, with Eton College. These schools of course serve primarily as state-of-the-art educational establishments, but secondarily as places where pupils can bond with the sons and daughters of other wealthy people, forging such circles that can be relied on later on in life. Nepotism, basically. Now considering I described the middle class as being demonic, you probably expect me to say the upper class are even worse, right? But no, actually. As while the upper class are typically massively pro-globalization, pro-mass migration, and pro-practically every other spiritually defunct policy, I am, actually, somewhat more sympathetic with them. Because you see, while the classes typically stick to themselves, in the rare case they do interact with each other, it is often with those who are directly above or under them. Hence, I call the middle class demons, because they see the issues of the working class and are just intent on making them worse. The upper class, on the other hand, never interact with the working class at all. I mean, seriously, how is a guy who gets driven around in a limo possibly meant to meet someone who uses public transport? They won't, obviously. So it shouldn't exactly be a surprise to anyone when they don't know how to govern properly. If you have a lot of wealth and grew up within such isolated circles, you kind of have a license to be ignorant, at least in my view. And that's really all the upper classes are, not evil just ignorant, living in their own little world, kind of like a red panda cub. In fact, in terms of attitude, the upper classes actually tend to be extremely polite and pleasant people in general. Granted, I suppose it's not really difficult to be like that when the only real worry you've ever had to deal with in life is what colour Mercedes you want, but I digress. Speaking of Mercedes, a big giveaway that someone is part of the upper class, barring constantly talking like a TV presenter, is that they never feel the need to brag or signal about their wealth, unlike what poor people tend to do after they get their first paycheck. They typically don't care about branded clothes, flashy watches, or golden phones, because they feel like they have nothing to prove to the world. That's not to say that the upper class don't enjoy a luxury here and there but more so that such luxuries tend to be enjoyed on a more personal and private level. Getting a bespoke custom-made suit from the same tailor your father got his from. Smoking a D.O. number no. 2 cigar to celebrate your 18th birthday. Participating in the perpetual war against foxes that your ancestors have been engaged in since the times of Jesus. In terms of housing, they tend to live in some nondescript apartment in a good part of the city, but also secretly have some pseudo-mansion out in the country that only five people on Earth even know about. If you haven't noticed yet, the art of the British upper class is subtlety, which is probably why they've managed to form such a powerful nepotistic collective for so long without being properly challenged. Those sneaky bastards. 
In summary, the British upper class are the nation's privately educated nepotists, who, because of their wide smiles and immense subtlety, are often not minded by most people, barring the most fanatical of communists, who don't really dislike them, but just wish they were them. Simple as. All right, cue the Deus Ex soundtrack. This is where it gets serious, as it's time to talk about the class above them all. The overclass. The best way to describe the British overclass are those who have transcended wealth. I said earlier that the upper class was the wealthiest class of them all, and I meant it. There are people in the upper class who are wealthier than even those in the overclass, but it doesn't matter, because it's one thing to have money, and it's another thing to have your face on money. The British overclass is a tiny group of highly influential families who have historically ruled over the land for generations, with the royal family, of course, being the most prominent of them all. They have titles such as Baron, Baroness, Lord and Lady, and more than a third of all British land is in the hands of such aristocrats and landed gentry. 33% of the entire country. As for how they live and what they actually get up to in their free time, it is simply unknown. The overclass is, after all, an invite-only club, with a very small membership list. But the first thing you really have to understand about such people is that they unofficially have diplomatic immunity, meaning that they are above the law. A member of the British overclass could commit any crime, even the worst thing you could imagine, and they would absolutely get away with it. Take Prince Andrew, for example. Everyone knows he's a, as we say in the UK, nonce, and yet isn't behind bars like someone from any other class would be. On the contrary, he's living it up in some palace somewhere just like the rest of them, protected from justice by mere birthright alone. And this may sound surprising, but it really shouldn't be. After all, every single prison in the UK starts off with the letters HM, such as HM Prison Berwyn, HM Prison Park, or HM Prison Belmarsh, where, at the time of recording, Julian Assange is currently being held. But what does HM stand for? Well, depending on the time, his Majesty or Her Majesty. Every prison in the UK is property of, and in service to, none other than the monarch. And so of course Prince Andrew wasn't ever going to be sent to prison. After all, it's his mother who owned them all. Uh, actually, I think you'll find that that's just symbolic. I mean, the Royal Air Force is called Royal, but does that mean that the Royal Family own the Air Force? No, it's just symbolic, and this is incredibly ignorant. Shut up. Symbolism is way more important than what people think. Many people believe that such people are powerless, mere historical artefacts, old money families, only kept for the sake of tradition. And this is partially true. After all, it's the global neoliberal paradigm that really rules the UK these days. But nevertheless, that doesn't mean that such an overclass are powerless, but that on the contrary, they are above power, above politics. In fact, the British Parliament is even called the House of Commons for that very reason. Politics, in Britain, is for commoners. They have no need for such petty quarrels. Even the name of the country, the United Kingdom, is a reference to such people, with kingdom meaning king's dominion. And the anthem of the country isn't about celebrating the land or its people, but hoping the monarch lives as long as possible. All of the fundamentals of the British state are all about cultivating a slavish cult-like adoration of this one supposedly flawless family alongside their friends and how fortunate we are to have them as our head of state and inner circle. All unelected and unaccountable, of course. And we call North Korea a cult. You know, I'm really starting to understand why almost every dystopian novel under the sun was written by a British author. 
For, as George Orwell put it, Britain clearly is the most class-ridden society under the sun. In summary, the British overclass are the nation's unaccountable, unelected, and unremarkable ancient aristocrats, who desperately need to be replaced with people who actually live in the real world. Simple as. So, there we have it. The British class system explained. If you've ever wondered why British people are all so different from one another in such an extreme way, well, now you know. Many of you may get the impression that the reason I made this production is some sort of call to equality, but that is absolutely not the case, as the reality is that not all men are equal. Some are strong, some are weak. Some are smart, some are dumb. Some are moral, some are immoral. Therefore, equality of outcome, contrary to popular belief, is not a good thing. Equality of opportunity, on the other hand, absolutely is. And that's the real problem with the British class system. It's not that people are unequal in outcome, but that the class system currently functions as a sort of birthright curse, or blessing, depending on where you fall, which determines the rest of your life, regardless of what you do. Hence why the most logical thing that any Brit who isn't in the upper class or overclass can do, which is the vast majority of the population, is to just leave the country at the first opportune moment. As without sounding unpatriotic or treasonous, there are so many better places a person could make a life for themselves, and until the UK somehow dissolves this wretched system, this shall always be the case. The class system in Britain is something that is a constant fog over the country, an unspoken plague that no one seems to have any real concrete solutions to, because there are no solutions, or at least, any easy ones. Other countries dissolved their classes by immense social and economic upheaval, and that's typically just not something you invite, especially when you're as passive, easygoing, and docile as most of the modern British population today. But I nevertheless remain certain that such a system is doomed to collapse sometime in this century. For the people at the top of British society are almost never there for merit, but mere luck. And should the UK continue to be ran by privileged yet inept imbeciles as it currently is, then Britain's own cultural revolution is merely an inevitability. Totalitarian regime, anyone? Totalitarian regime? No? Ugh. Oh. Well, look, it's inevitable anyway, so they better get used to the idea. Am I right? I'll tell you now. The future of Great Britain will simply be a cesspool of decay. A cesspool of decadence and debauchery. Alright folks, I hope you enjoyed that. You know, I've been wanting to make this production for over a year, but uh, I knew that if I started talking about the class system, then I'd be, you know, it would end up being such a behemoth that I'd be going on for like 50 minutes or something, and that's exactly what's happened, so I've been putting it off. But, you know, I'm specifically curious to hear from British people in the 20 to 40 age range, specifically about are you planning to stay in the UK or leave? It's because a lot of, I think a lot of people realise that when they understand that Britain is an odd country with this archaic class system, they want to leave and go to somewhere where there's more opportunity, somewhere less, uh, less established, like Australia or Canada, or even the United States, which is where a lot of people uh, who, I, who I know want to go or have gone. You know, as a nationalistic person, it kind of hurts me in a way because I want to stay in Britain, I want to see Britain do well, but Britain will only change if its class system gets destroyed, and its class system will only get destroyed if, if the nation reaches absolute rock bottom, which it looks like it is doing, but I mean really rock bottom. Dystopia, hellhole, levels of terrible. So I'm really curious from young British people, like, what's your game plan? Because you obviously have to be aware of the class system. You know how terrible it is. So are you planning on staying or leaving? Really curious to hear that specifically. 
Nevertheless, I want to thank the patrons on the Wall of Fame. It's been a while, my apologies. And yeah, I'll see you next time.